Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. My name's Chris, and today we're gonna talk about the new Raspberry Pi 4. This new Raspberry Pi is a huge step up from the previous generation, but it's not without its issues. So we're gonna cover all of that in this video. First though, for anyone who may not be familiar with this product, what exactly is a Raspberry Pi? Well, basically, Raspberry Pi is a low cost, single board computer that includes everything you would find in a full size desktop PC, such as CPU, RAM, networking, graphics card, and more. Raspberry Pi computers have all sorts of different uses from retro gaming consoles to prototyping new products, weather stations, the list goes on and on. You're really only limited by your imagination. Now above all, they are an excellent platform for learning. Computer programming, Python C or Scratch, prototyping, network and sysadmin stuff, but most of all, and the reason that I love them so much, is they're just super, super fun to play with for both professionals and hobbyists alike. The Raspberry Pi 4 starts at just $35 USD for the one gigabyte version of the board itself. However, if you're just getting started with Raspberry Pi, I would recommend one of the starter kits that includes everything you need to get up and running quickly. My personal preference is the Raspberry Pi starter kit from Canakit, which includes the Raspberry Pi, some heat sinks, a micro SD card pre-formatted with the Noobs operating system loader, a power cable, and an HDMI cable for connecting to a monitor. To start off, we're gonna talk about the specs of the Raspberry Pi 4, as well as what's changed since the previous model. But if you're interested in learning how to get up and running with a Raspberry Pi, make sure you subscribe to Crosstalk Solutions for our upcoming video on getting started with the Raspberry Pi 4. The first thing to mention is the new CPU. The Raspberry Pi 4 features a Broadcom quad-core 1.5 gigahertz processor, and it's probably the biggest improvement to this board. The processor is now so powerful that this system is being marketed as a potential desktop PC replacement, and they're really not that far off. In my testing, I think that most people would be able to do most of their web surfing, emailing, and just general computer work on this board without too much trouble, though higher end needs such as photo manipulation, video editing, high end gaming, anything like that would really still be pretty difficult to achieve. We're gonna talk more about this later in the video. I'm not gonna go into the actual benchmarking of the Pi 4 because there are already a number of people who have done so and have done a much better job than I possibly could. So for example, I'll put a link in the description to an article from Magpie, which is the official Raspberry Pi magazine. And as you can see from the graph, the Pi 4 blows the previous Pi 3s out of the water with a three to four times improvement in processing power. Another excellent resource on benchmarking is Don over at the Nova Spirit Tech YouTube channel. I will also link to Don's video on Raspberry Pi 4 benchmarking where he got some excellent results in his testing. And also if you're interested in this kind of single board computer content, I recommend subscribing to Nova Spirit Tech on YouTube. When the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus came out and it only had one gig of RAM, a lot of people were upset and wanted to see at least two gigs on the Pi. However, keeping the cost down to $35 is really a challenge when you start bumping up the RAM. So with the release of the Raspberry Pi 4, you can now choose your amount of RAM. The base one gig version is still around 35 bucks, but you can now go for a two gig version for 10 bucks more, or a four gig version for 20 bucks more. So for the $20 price difference between the Pi 4 one gig and the Pi 4 four gig, I would almost always recommend that people get the four gig version, especially if you're gonna be doing anything close to using this device as a desktop replacement. Another new feature of the Raspberry Pi 4 is full gigabit ethernet. The previous generation did have a gigabit NIC on board, but it shared the USB 2.0 bus on the board, meaning that the maximum throughput you could achieve with the Raspberry Pi 3 was 300 megabits per second. Now this is no longer the case as the gigabit NIC on the Pi 4 now offers full speed network connectivity with no bottlenecks. I personally tested the throughput of the Pi 4 and I can confirm that it does indeed provide full gigabit speeds. The Pi 4 still features dual band 802.11ac, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz wireless connectivity, but they upped the Bluetooth version from 4.2 to version 5. 
Now, Bluetooth 5 allows for more range as well as faster Bluetooth speeds than the previous version. I have my Oontz uh, Bluetooth speaker here hooked up to my Raspberry Pi 4 in order to play some tunes on the Pi while I was working on it, and it absolutely worked great. Now, this opens up the opportunity to use Raspberry Pi as a streaming audio device. The previous generation Pi 3 included four USB 2.0 ports. The Pi 4 improves on this by adding a pair of USB 3.0 ports in addition to two 2.0 ports. Now having USB 3.0 speeds on this board opens up some great possibilities such as using the Pi 4 as a mini NAS device with multiple connected USB 3.0 external hard drives. And it's even rumored that in the future, the Raspberry Pi 4 will support the ability to boot from USB 3. Or in other words, you should soon be able to use an external SSD as the Pi 4 boot drive instead of a micro SD card. It's worth mentioning here that the NIC and the USB ports switched places on the Pi 4, meaning that the new Raspberry Pi is not compatible with older generation cases. It is, however, still compatible with some other accessories such as the Raspberry Pi PoE hat. Now, I tested the PoE hat on the Raspberry Pi 4 and it worked just fine. Another improvement is that the Pi 4 now features dual micro HDMI ports for dual monitor support. Now, this is a mixed bag. Like on one hand, it's awesome that this board now has dual monitor support out of the box. On the other hand, some people have complaints about the micro HDMI form factor of this feature. I can imagine that it would have been a really difficult process to include two full size HDMI ports on such a tiny little board. So to me, the trade off to micro HDMI is perfectly acceptable in order to do you know, dual monitor capability. The specs also claim that this board can drive two 4K displays at up to 4K P30 or a single 4K dis display at up to 4K P60. Now, I don't have any 4K monitors, so I can't test this out myself, but I'd really be surprised if this board can actually provide a good 4K user experience. In my own testing, the board had trouble playing YouTube videos smoothly at 720p uh, on in full screen on a 1920 by 1080 monitor, let alone 4K. It was definitely watchable, but it did have some latency and stutters. I would not recommend using this device as a media center for streaming video. Finally, the input power on the Pi 4 is now USB type C, whereas the previous generations used micro USB as the power source. Now, I personally prefer USB type C since the plug fits into the connector in either direction, which is not the case with micro USB. But the problem is that many people have already complained that the Pi 4 is unable to be powered by a lot of different USB type C power adapters on the market, including the ones that come with Apple MacBook laptops. Now, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that problem here, but I will link to an excellent article that goes into the schematics and wiring of the USB Type-C connector on the Raspberry Pi 4. In most cases, this is not gonna be an issue, but I would be surprised if Raspberry Pi 4 doesn't fix this for the next version of their Pi 4, or even comes out with an updated version of this board in the near future. Now, for what it's worth, I use the official Raspberry Pi 4 power adapter, and of course, it works perfectly fine. I also tried the USB Type-C power adapter that came with my Nintendo Switch, and that one also works fine. It seems like it kind of only affects the, the MacBook uh, USB Type-C power chargers. Bottom line though, is that if you stick with the official Raspberry Pi power adapter, you're not gonna have any issues. I'll mention again that the Raspberry Pi starter kit from Canakit does come with the correct power adapter. I would also recommend getting one of these Raspberry Pi power buttons. Now, if you're doing a lot of experimenting, this is gonna come in really, really handy and will prevent you from having to constantly disconnect and reconnect the power cable, which could possibly damage the USB Type-C connector. I'll have links in the description below to all of this equipment. So now let's talk about some issues with the Pi 4. Now, the first is heat. With a more powerful CPU comes additional heat load. The Raspberry Pi 4 throttles down the CPU speed once it reaches 80 degrees Celsius. Now, I've been able to replicate this myself by stress testing the CPU. Heat sinks do help, but really they just delay the amount of time before the CPU has to throttle itself down. I did, however, get some great results with the Pimeroni fan shim 
and I'm going to be doing a completely separate video on Raspberry Pi heat testing. So make sure you subscribe to Crosstalk Solutions if you haven't already. Also with the faster CPU comes higher power requirements. So the idle power requirements for the Raspberry Pi 4 are about 35% higher than the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B+. So that means if you're doing any projects where the Pi is going to run on batteries or if it's going to run on solar, it would actually be best to use one of the older model Raspberry Pis that isn't quite so power hungry. Now let's talk about the claim of using Raspberry Pi 4 as a desktop replacement. Now, as I mentioned earlier in my testing, I found that the Pi 4 works reasonably well with dual monitors and could possibly function as a desktop replacement for general web surfing, emails, and similar functions. But when you start loading it down with any sort of multimedia, it starts to bog down. So for instance, I can play 1080p YouTube videos fairly well in the browser and even actually in theater mode. But in full screen, it's really not as smooth as you would expect it to be. So right here, I have a 4K demo going. This is a, you know, a demo of 4K video. This is not a 4K monitor. This is just a 1080p monitor. Um, the resolution is already at 1080p for this video. And you can see that it is playing relatively smoothly on the Raspberry Pi when it's in the browser, when it's in this format. But if we take it full screen, thinking it's thinking and what you're going to see here is it just it just stutters a lot right so it just has trouble playing full screen at this resolution it's not terrible but it's not as good as like you know watching 4k on a 4k television now for gaming honestly don't even try it you're not going to have a good experience bottom line is that this is definitely not a desktop replacement for anyone with what i would consider to be standard user needs these days i mean Technically, it could be a desktop computer in the same way that technically a 1982 Honda Civic is a car. I mean, sure, it's a car. It's just not a very good one by today's standards. So because of this, I wouldn't expect a lot of people to use the dual monitor capability, but there are some really interesting use cases for it one of which is digital signage for marketing purposes. So having the ability to output different signage to different screens in the same location does have some interesting possibilities and could certainly cut down on the number of Raspberry Pis you have to use for that purpose. Since the Raspberry Pi 4 came out, I've been seeing a bunch of videos on YouTube that talk about how you should not buy a Raspberry Pi 4 or how you should wait until they fix some of the issues or you know the top things wrong with this board. I am not in that same camp. I think this thing is freaking awesome. And I wish they had this kind of technology when I was a kid. I mean, guys, this is a fully complete working computer that sits in the palm of my hand. I mean, how cool is that? Now, don't listen to the haters. If you're interested in learning, the Raspberry Pi 4 is an amazing tool and it's a super cost effective way to learn programming, prototyping, how to build projects, and yes, even have a really cheap, though, kind of underpowered desktop replacement. I'd say absolutely go for it. And I'm even gonna have a video coming up soon on a lot of the stuff that you can do with a Raspberry Pi 4 when you start using like a breadboard to break it out and LEDs and servos and gizmos and doodads. There's just so much you can do with this thing. It's just so much fun. I highly, highly recommend getting a Raspberry Pi 4 and just start learning, start playing with it. All right, well, that's gonna do it for this video. Make sure you subscribe to Crosstalk Solutions for more Raspberry Pi videos, including a new getting started video coming soon. As always, my name's Chris with Crosstalk Solutions, and thank you so much for watching.